Welcome back to the Ableton Music Producer Podcast. This is Dan Giffen. Today, we get to hang out with LP Giobi. She's a really dope piano house DJ and producer. LP and I have a great chat. We talk about her live DJ setup with piano, how she transitioned from a classical pianist background to going into electronic music, talk about how she organizes her files and presets to produce faster and develop her own workflow, We talk about different hacks in Ableton Live, such as playing with the audio clip features. We talk about managing your time and mental hurdles as a touring artist and producer. We talk about a lot of great stuff. But LP, if you don't know her, she has played a lot of major festivals, including Lollapalooza. She's opened up for Mark Ribier, which is a great story, by the way, in the episode. She's also had tracks landing her on the cover of Spotify's Friday Crate Diggers, Amazon's Fresh Dance and Deezer's New Dance playlist. Uh, she's the co-founder of a publishing company called Animal Talk and runs the group Them House, which is a great organization helping other producers. Uh, so she's got a lot of really cool things to talk about. But before we dive in, I have to give a huge shout out, as you may know, to our friends Melodics. Uh, it's a great desktop app. You can download and practice your skills producing from the studio to stage. I know you've heard me talk about it a lot on this podcast, but I'm telling you, it's a really fun way to gamify your practicing in the studio. And it's great for helping you grow your skills playing piano or finger drumming, playing an electronic drum set. You can plug in almost any MIDI controller and start having fun practicing right away with their huge lesson variety. So check them out if you haven't already. We love Melodics. Uh, They've been great for this podcast, and they make really cool tools for producers and performers. So Melodics.com, if you decide to try the free trial, check it out. If you want more options and lessons and genres to play and practice, then try out their subscription and save some money with the discount code LPO-20. That's LPO-20. Also, before we jump into the episode, I wanted to let you know, if you don't own the latest version of Ableton Live, Happy to hook you up with the deal. Just go to liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton. Save that money. Definitely worth upgrading. There's a lot of cool features and tools, effects, and workflows in the new Live 11. If you're newer to the podcast, I'm going to be releasing episodes every Tuesday, so stay connected. You can be the first to know when episodes come out if you go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter. And I have a really awesome series with Ableton certified trainers coming out talking about production workflows. Max for Live, Mixing Mastering, so much good stuff on the way, so stay tuned. Much love, everybody, for listening. Thanks in advance for the like, subscribe, wherever you're listening to the podcast. And yeah, and now today's episode with LP Giobi. Cool. How are things in Austin these days? I wouldn't know. I am home maybe like a day or two a week at this point. Yeah, you've been playing a lot of shows lately. (laughs) Man. It's crazy because I feel like I should have more energy than I do, but I have to, I'm trying to like be nicer to myself. I'm like, okay, I consider like all of my travel days are usually like, like on Sunday or like, you know, like a day off. Traveling is just a lot. It's kind of an exhausting thing. Yeah. I like I'm beating myself up. Like you should be less tired, but I feel tired. (laughs) I'm more just wanting more sleep anyways. Yeah. Sleep's important. Are you a coffee drinker? (sighs) Honestly, to a, to a point where I'm like, is it even working anymore? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I actually just like this whole thing is just filled to the brim with coffee. Mm, yeah, no, that's I, I like the Christmas mug. That's a nice touch. You know, I, I love Christmas. So I always drink out of a Christmas mug. <laughs> Me too. Me too. I have a good penguin mug with a scarf and a, like a Santa hat. Sick. That's my favorite. I love yeah. that. Well, thanks again for joining the podcast. Um, yeah, man. We could sit here and talk about Christmas if you want to, but <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of other good things I'd love to pick your brain about. I love that. Let's do it. Yeah, I was uh, jamming out on the ride home from the coffee shop this morning, listening to your uh, your tracks on Spotify. Yay! And, and you've got some really good like piano house tunes. Like anybody, if you haven't listened to LP yet, uh, definitely check out her stuff. It's real bouncy. I really like it. I appreciate that, man. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like you can't be in a bad mood and listen to piano house at the same time. Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny though. It's like my top five tracks right now on Spotify are not my favorite songs. So really? Yeah. Not even close, which is like, uh, but you know, it is what it is. It is yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I, I mean my top five tracks on my Spotify are not my favorite tracks of mine, which is funny. So oh, got you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, how was Lala? You recently played that not too long ago. Um, it was awesome. I played it on two days ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it was crazy uh, on Sunday. 
it was just a, it was wild to be back at a, I mean, I had played like Ubby, Ubby Dubby and, um, um, Insomniac's Day Trip. So I played like some electronic focus festivals, but this is mm-hmm. my first like mainstream festival back, you know? So, um, like rock bands and like all, you know, just like the, one of the bigger mainstream festivals in a city, like the outside yeah. bands and the Coachella's and the Lollapalooza, right? That's huge. And it was my f- first time being at Lala too, which was cool. Okay. Um, my family's from Chicago. So, and my brother lives there still. And my whole family, like my aunts, my uncles, my cousins, my parents, like everybody came, which That's was huge. really cool. <laughs> and to so be able cool. to share this with them and actually have them see me perform live for the first time in two years. Wow. Um, it was just, a, so that was really beautiful. And then actually one of the coolest parts, so I played an after party with, a guy named Mark Ribellet. Have you heard oh, of this guy? Yeah, Mark Ribier. Yeah, he's Ribier. awesome. Oh my God, that's so embarrassing. He's amazing. It's Ribier. Yeah, no, it's no, Ribier. no, it's cool. I said that for the longest time and one of my friends corrected me. And it's, it's cool. It's Ribier is how he pronounces it? Yeah. So I yeah. played, I opened for him at House of Blues in Chicago at the after party. That's and amazing. At first, I was, at first amazing. I was like, who is this guy? What the hell? Like, why was it's I booked so on this funny. bill? I was like, kind of like annoyed, a, you know, a little bit. I'm like, <laughs> this guy does like, he's a comedian like why am i opening up for a comedian it's gonna be so awkward i'm a dj you know <laughs> and then i i the curtains opened and the crowd first of all the show sold out in like a matter of oh, seconds yeah. all of his shows do yeah. so i the, i was like okay so this is kind of crazy and the curtain opened and it was like the most diverse beautiful looking crowd i'd ever seen and i'm yeah. used to playing these like kind of more ed i mean festivals you know and i was like this yeah. is amazing yeah so immediately i loved his fans and so then i stayed to watch his show and i was Alone away. Yeah. He's so talented. He really um, is. But truly to like just his like ability to say yes and to everything. Mm-hmm. He's like he's like a like a conductor of chaos. It was oh, yeah. unbelievable. It was it was really inspiring. He's awesome. Yeah, I love his flamingo skit. Uh, if you ever get the chance, look up his flamingo parody where he's okay. like <laughs> he's singing about being a flamingo and just like terrorizing people. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I can't wait to do that. Also, so then after that, I was like so like the after party was so great and his show was so great that I was like full of energy still. And yeah, okay, so I've never been to Smart Bar in Chicago where like literally house music started. Like Blessed Madonna started there, Honey yeah. Dijon. It's like its history is like it's <clears throat> I mean, it's it's like deeply rooted in house music in Chicago. And um Derek Carter was playing at you know one of the legends of house music was playing at smart yeah. bar which i had never been to and like read so much about so i got to go over and see him play and it was just like the perfect ending to an amazing weekend that's so cool but maybe that's, that's why huge. i'm tired <laughs> well yeah no totally i mean it's a real thing i mean that's first of all congrats that's huge mark ribier is a total badass i love him and i've been trying to see him live for a while now but and then i was trying to his agent for a really long time you know he was like hey like did you have fun playing the show we'd love to work with you more in the future or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, I was like, cool. Like, where are you guys playing? And like <laughs> the amount of tickets he's doing is. Yeah. It's insane. Fucking crazy. <laughs> well, he was the first one to really do a tour when touring stopped during COVID because he was the first guy to do like a nationwide tour with drive-ins. So he was oh, he like, did the drive-in tours. Yeah. So his drive, he was the first to do like the drive-in tours that I'm aware of in the country. And was like selling them out left and right when COVID was still happening. But he's, yeah, he's, he's an the OG. nicest. Yeah, Afterwards, we like, we hung out with him and his team for a while and they were all beautiful, wonderful. It was great. It yeah. really, that's really, so cool. and the Pass of Blues was amazing. Oh, that, yeah, that is a cool venue. I love that in Chicago yeah. for sure. Well, yeah. congrats. That's so dope. Like, hey, I'm really thanks. happy for you. You're doing some cool things. I appreciate that. Uh, how did you get started like into music production? Maybe this is just a good segue. Like, how did yeah. you Yeah, get- my journey into this moment is fucking can i cuss on this sorry yeah that's fine no you can't it's cool no worries is effing intense uh it's so funny if somebody had told me what it would take uh and like you know i'm at the very beginning in my path the very very beginning and if somebody had told me what it would take i would have been like no thank you (laughs) i'm gonna just stick with this nine to five here um which is good you know i think ignorance in that way is bliss like just thinking like because it allows you just to focus on one brick a day and then like eventually the wall will be built. But if like you, if you had to take a step back and be like, how much work will it take to build this wall? You would never build it, you know? Yeah, <laughs> so um, I started learning piano in second grade. I begged my parents for piano lessons and they were like, you seem pretty young, but like maybe we'll try to find you a teacher. And um, I mean, the best thing, the luckiest thing that ever happened to me ever in my life is my parents found this piano teacher, Carolyn Horn. And she is unbelievable so she like you know I, I studied with her from second grade all the way through graduating high school in my in Eugene Oregon where I grew up and like in middle school when I was like 
you know, not really wanting to practice as much and like wanted to just like flirt with boys and whatever. She continued to like keep me engaged. She like cultivated creativity in a way that I've never seen any teacher. I've studied with a lot of teachers at this point. Um, like on so- some days we'd play like just the inside of her Busendorfer grand piano, her concert grand that she built her house around. Um, mm-hmm. Other days we would like just play the bongos and other days we would just dance. So she just like made music this fun, joyous experience for me. That's awesome. And so I always wanted to stick with it. So then when I went to college, I um, was in the marching band at UC Berkeley and I also studied jazz Shout piano. Per- <laughs> Shout out. <laughs> I also studied jazz piano performance. Uh, then I, I studied jazz piano performance with Meyer Melford. At, I, I was studying jazz a little bit in high school as well. So I had two teachers, a jazz teacher and a classical teacher. Yeah. And then um, focused on jazz because there was, I had an amazing teacher, Myra Melford at UC Berkeley. Uh, and she was like, you know, all about like before you play, like open the top of your head and like let the universe come through you. And it's like not about you. It's about the, the music that's coming through you. And yeah. she was amazing. And so then I graduated from UC Berkeley and I was like, had a degree in jazz piano performance. And I was like, what the fuck? Because my parents were like, you know, just like take all the classes you like and like, you know, it'll just be your undergrad. I was pretty like a uh, type A studious. I thought I would always get a master's or something degree. Mm-hmm. And so I didn't think that my under- undergrad really mattered. But then I graduated and I was like, okay, now I'm in debt from like out of state tuition and I need to get a job. And like, what? Like my like <laughs> like parents, that was the worst advice you could have given me. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thanks um, for the debt. Yeah, thanks so much for that. But uh, I was reading at my last my last semester in college. I was reading this book called Bill Graham Presents, and I don't know if you know the history of Bill Graham, but he was one of like the first big concert promoters in the Bay Area. He like, you know, put the Grateful Dead on a stage for the first time. Yeah, like yeah. promoted them, and um, you know, all like the se- the greats of the seventies. So. <clears throat> I, my parents are deadheads. And so I felt like really connected to this book. And I was like, wow, like a concert promoter. I didn't even know that was a thing. And I got really excited. And so I found out that the predecessor to Bill Graham, the guy who took over his company, a guy named Greg Perloff, started another Planet Entertainment. And he lived, and, and he opened an office down the street from my apartment in Berkeley. So I was like, wait, this is, this is maybe, maybe meant to be. So I, I wrote a letter as to why he should hire me. And I walked down t- to their office and I, rang the bell and I pretend like I had a meeting with the CEO. <clears throat> and so they let me in <laughs> Amazing. and they saw that I was like a 20 year old girl. And they were like, um, he's busy, but luckily he walked out of his office right then. And so I handed him the letter. I was like, Greg Perloff, my name is Leah. And this is why you should hire me. And he was like, this is kind of like, I could tell he was like, should I like call the police, like throw this girl out or, <laughs> but he read the letter and he hired me. So wow. I started working for a concert promoter. And like, that's really where I learned they do outside lands music festival the Fox Theater, the Greek Theater in Berkeley, yeah, all these like beautiful, iconic venues. And I, you know, learned what like a booking agent is, what an agent is, what a manager is, you know, all the ins and outs of the of the industry really. And at night I would still play jazz piano gigs at um this this bar in San Francisco, just like some solo jazz piano gigs. And one night <clears throat> a gentleman named Peter Franco was was in the room and asked if I wanted to join an all-female electronic band in Los Angeles. <laughs> And I was like, at this point, I didn't even know what a synthesizer was. But my piano teacher, Carolyn Horn, when she was when I was studying with her in high school, at the age of 65 for her, she went back to University of Oregon, taught herself electronic music, didn't even own a computer at the time. And she was the only woman in the, in the program and the only person over 25. And um, I was really inspired by that. And so I was like, okay, maybe this is my opportunity to like kind of like learn this stuff that she would like kind of talk to me about a little bit. In the pyramid from their pyramid tour. <laughs> oh wow! <That's laughs> and awesome. um, had like the most amazing support. And it was a band of full of jazz students who, like, we all had jazz backgrounds: jazz drummer, jazz bass player, me, jazz singer, and we we're like learning electronic instrumentation together. Sort of. It was it was a wild like learn. That I mean, sounds like and it. again, like he was like, oh, if you know, like you know, I, if you know, we're really trying to put together a band of like musicians, and if you know like music theory and all that, the electronic stuff will be easy for you. Because yeah. I was like, I don't think I'm qualified for this, but okay. Ugh, I'm so glad you told me it was easy again, or else I never would have done it. It was so, like, the learning curve for me was really, really steep. Really? And I spent years, like, in a garage every single day, waking up, going into the garage and, like, watching tutorials, trying to teach myself. I started in Pro Tools because we were doing, like, a lot of live recording, too. Like, yeah. And, and at, like, our live show is... I had like seven cents. MIDI. We, did, we didn't do anything with tracks, unfortunately. And so everything was live and we were using all vintage synths. And so I had like 
we like midi clocked everything together and we had one SPDX that was like sort of our clock that, yep. and, and, but I get like our drummer didn't really want to be on a click cause she's, you know, she's, she's, <laughs> she's a jazz amazing. player. She's a she's jazz like, player. Free. Yeah, Just be totally, free. <laughs> totally. So there was like, um, the amount of brain power and energy that took was mind blowing. Um, uh-huh. and it was an awesome experience. And that's where I learned how to start producing. Um, and, where I learned how to synthesize, synthesize and got into synthesizers and filled in for this, like for an after party DJ. I mean, I did not know how to DJ. I had Serato and that was it. I, but Sophie Tucker was the headliner and I loved them. They had just released drinky. And I was like, I have to figure out, like, I, I can do this. I can fill in and I can open up for their after party. Yeah. <laughs> and I did not know what I was doing. And it was a fucking horrible set. <laughs> there was nobody there except for my mom. And she was like literally only on the dance floor to feed me chicken nuggets. Actually, it was just like I remember thinking, <laughs> "What am I doing with my life? This can't be it." That's amazing. Um, and I left, and I got after they played. I left, and I got a DM from them. And they're like, "Hey, we actually were backstage listening to your whole set. We love the music you played. Do you want to come on tour with us?" And wow. I was like, "I am." I, I first of all I thought like it was it had to be a joke. Yeah. And then I was like, "Are you serious?" Um, they're like, "Yeah." I was like, "Well, I actually don't know how to DJ." And they're like, "Well, do you want to come or not? We thought you were fine." <laughs> <laughs> so then I went on the road with them and like learned how to DJ in front of people, failing night after night. That's cool. The first half of the tour. Yeah. Um, and then that you know made me kind of want to like make music that I could DJ to a dance floor. So then I started making dance music. That was a really, really good. That was a really long story. <laughs> no, but that's a great story. Shout out to Caroline, first of all. I mean, she's a boss. That's really cool. Who? Your teacher, right? Oh yeah, Caroline. Caroline. Yeah, Caroline. yeah. She, Sorry, she, Caroline. No, yeah. totally. She is. Oh, she's the ultimate boss. She is. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's pretty dope. Yeah, coming from like that whole jazz traditional background, do you feel like that's given you a big advantage with electronic music in some ways, or do you actually? Think that you know matter? what? I actually don't. And like, it's funny because okay. like in most sessions that I go in, um, <clears throat> a lot of the producers that I work with don't have that background. Like that's mm-hmm. actually pretty rare for electronic producer at this point. You know, there's so many, um, self-taught, whatever. And I actually kind of think that sometimes it hinders me in a way because I find that I use my brain more than my ear. Like I know that, Oh, we're in the key of C. Like I know that these notes for these chords will like go well over it. And sometimes I think that if I had to just like use my ear and play around, I maybe <laughs> would come up with more interesting things. Sometimes I, I rely on my, my like knowledge, my music theory yeah. knowledge too much. Um, and also, I mean, I just, I, I mean, I, I, I make piano house, you know? So like, right. yes, that uh, in some ways it definitely helps me. And it's been fun to like bring in my jazz background, like some more interesting chords and stuff, but hmm. it's just such a separate part of my brain that I had to learn all like the engineering production side of things. Yeah. And I really wished that I had done that earlier in my life. <laughs> yeah. I think there's only so much though you can really learn in the engineering mixing side of things because in the end of the day, yeah, at some point you have to use your ear, you know? Yeah. I think, I think if it sounds good, it sounds good. And you were self-taught in a lot of electronic music production anyway, it sounds like. Yeah, totally. Just, like, All of it, really. Searching tutorials aimlessly. Yes. <laughs> searching tutorials aimlessly. Yes. Yeah. Like, <laughs> wait, how do I do this? Yes. And I actually had a really great, a guy named Joe Computo. Um, he teaches at a few different schools in LA, a few different production schools, but he happened to be my neighbor and also just an amazing mentor and taught me so much. He's a um, Ableton expert Cool. and taught me so much. So like I would yeah. constantly, he's on speed dial for, wait, what do I, how do I? And he was so patient, so awesome and huge part of my story. Yeah. Like a, like a good neighbor. He was yeah. <laughs> State That's Farm all. is there. <laughs> yeah. Yes, totally. Joe Computo is there. Shout yeah. out to Joe. Shout out, Joe. That's awesome. What a what a story. I mean, you're playing a lot of really cool shows. You're doing a lot of exciting things now. I also think you have a really interesting life setup because uh, I dream of the day where I can carry a flash drive and just a piano because I have a whole band set up. Oh, that's so funny because I am like, you know, in my in this in all the stages I play, I'm the only one who has like anything live. And I'm like, gosh, if I could just why did I bring this 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 keyboard? If I just had to bring in a flash drive, that would yeah. be so much. So that's what is your setup? Oh, it's stupid. Actually, you want to see it real quick? Yeah. Actually? This is it. So I have uh, like my Apollo down here that you can barely see, which I think you have an Apollo, don't you? Is that yeah. in the background? Yeah. And then I've got like a standing drum set and then my SPD over here. So you uh, drum drums. over your tracks? Yes. Yep. And then I have a push, a little push. I play the push too. It's a good time. Wait, that is sick. It's I get a workout for sure every time I play, but... I think anytime you go to a show and you expect like a DJ lineup, like what you do 
kind of has a shock value to it because most people just expect some fist pumping, some fader turning and some effects, but like you're actually jamming out on like a nice piano on top of your tracks. And so like, I think anytime somebody sees that live element, they're like, Oh shit. And people go crazy for it. And they love that. It is funny how that is. I'm cause it's so funny. I'd like, for instance, Lollapalooza, there's so many bands playing, you know, and I'd be like, I watched some of the bands like, damn, it's just like, honestly, it's just it's so much, so much work that that goes into like a full band, you know, everybody learning their instruments, learning how to play them together. And like, when it's just me up there, I mean, yes, I'm playing the piano, but like I get to control all of it and it just feels a little bit easier. I have so much mm. respect for full bands. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think I think it is fun for some of the kids these days to see a, a real instrument up there. But I I, I even want to I want to expand on that. Like even seeing your drum kit, I'm like, oh, I would love to play with a drummer. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think there's like certain venues depend on the certain setups, right? You know, totally. So. Like for instance, the House of Blues would have been aw- like I felt kind of silly just like DJing and playing the piano. It would have been awesome to have. Like a it yeah on venue like if you're playing like when I tour Soph and Tuck makes more it would make sense for to like add another yeah. player but like when I'm you know some of these clubs absolutely not it's just uh, there's so many different ways to do it <laughs> that's true that's true it's easy to get lost in the sauce but yeah. um, I think once you kind of like streamline your setup it gets easier over time yeah um so but yeah I, I mean I like I said I'd love to come see a show sometime for sure oh I love where, where are you again based in Indiana. I'm in Indianapolis. Yeah. Indianapolis. For now. Oh, for, Indianapolis. Yeah. Yep. Okay. For the time being. Uh, yes. Yeah. I mean, if you ever want to play a show here, let me know. I know tons of people can set it up. But also, I'd love to talk about your process, like producing in Ableton cool. Live. Um, so, do you have like a template that you build out in Ableton when you open every project to start? Like, <laughs> what is your process, I guess? Okay, cool. I tried to do a template. <laughs> No, I like, I was like, okay, I'm going to do this the right way. I'm going to set up a template. Like, you know, I'm at least going to have like, m- like a kick and like, uh, you know, like a hat and like a few of the basic drum elements, like an 808 just kit sort of like loaded. I can always, obviously if it's in MIDI, I can just change it out later. Right. <clears throat> um, and you know, I'm going to have the, at 125 house music, right. Um, I'm going to have like my piano plug in that I like loaded to the setting that I like it. And it, and just, I don't know why every time I go to open a new, uh, start something new, I just go to Ableton, hit new, and then start all over. So I, I never <laughs> use the template. And I just I need the to same like, thing. You, it's did. so, f- I'm just like, this is yeah. not a good workflow. But it, here I am. And I think like sometimes, uh, I'm trying to like, why is that? Like, maybe I just like want to. So I I try to keep one studio day a week that's like completely free. Because yeah. at this point I'm doing like, I have like five remixes due next week, essentially. I have like, you know, my radio show, mm-hmm. um, like I'm working on an album. So it's like, <laughs> there's always like, you know, kind of the music work that's like, okay, I have to get this done. I have deadlines, whatever. And then I try to keep a day that's just like, usually a Saturday if I don't have a show, which is never anymore, but <laughs> it's Saturday morning, maybe even it's like no yeah. emails are coming in. I can just free. And then I kind of, I mean, it's kind of nice to just open a brand new temp session that doesn't have anything in it. Mm-hmm. And I have to go from scratch. So yeah. Um, that's sort of how I start. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm the same way too, though. I think for me, I've learned, like, I have a bunch of templates saved for different genres or scenarios, or even for podcast editing, um, with Ableton Live 11, they have templates now, but I never use those. Like I set those up and I never decided to use them ever, which makes no sense. So that's cool. But I think like having a good user library of like presets and saving that stuff has helped me (sighs) because I, I feel you though. Like when I open a new project, I don't want to feel like I have to produce with what's there. I can just kind of pull stuff that's already saved and then just go with it. Yeah. A lot of times what I do is like, I go to, I open up, so I'll be like in, in the session and then I go to a past session, you know, I'm like, oh, I know that I did that one really cool, uh, like white noise thing. And I'll go and try to find that I'll drag it in and then I'll change around the notes, you know, Yeah. yeah. that's like mostly how I work. It seems totally. Totally. Yeah. I wish I would have done that a long time ago. <laughs> well, and it's really? crazy how many people don't know that you can go to when you're in. Cause like a lot of times I've like, I was recently in a session where I saw them like close out the session, open up the session, the, you know, the session they wanted to pull from bounce that and then open up the first session and then pull it. And I'm like, dude, you know, you can just like drag that whole track yeah. into the new, that was like, when I discovered that, that changed everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You can totally just copy and paste several tracks from one tr- uh, project to another. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That's gold. Um, I love it. As far as like instruments and effects in Ableton Live, do you have like some go-tos that you always use and how do you use those? Yeah. Um, I use the piano tech, the Modart piano tech all the time. I mean, that's like every, I mean, I really should have a template with that in it because that's the piano and I 
don't know the last time I made a track without a piano. So I always do that. And then I use for bass a lot. I use the um, Moda bass. So it sounds Moda like bass. an... Yeah, an electric. Yeah, yeah, I've heard of that. I haven't used it. I've heard other people it's on the podcast really talk good. about it. really good. Todd Edwards actually was the one who turned me on the bat. Nice um, plug-in. Like really good uh, electric bass sounds. Okay. Like so much that I work with a, with an amazing bass, bass player. Electric bass player, his name is Michael Cheever. And he even was fooled like, oh, is this a real... And I was like, no, it's a plug-in. Let's go. <laughs> yeah, that's by IK Multimedia, right? The Moto Bass? Uh, I don't know. Probably maybe. Yeah, it's like a bass. It's like an electric bass. <laughs> yes, yes, emulation. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was using like a lot of the contact drums for like more glo- like world drum sounds. Mm, yeah, that's um, cool. Some they of the have some packs. Good libraries. Yeah, I've sort of yeah. that, that's been a while, but the, I used to that used to really had that be my go to. Like the cool. yeah. Um, have you ever messed with Trillion? Speaking of basses, no. Shout out Trillion. I would love to have them sponsor the podcast so I can get more of their stuff for free. Trillion. <laughs> Yeah, like if I could only if somebody like put me on a desert island with laptop and like Dan, you only get one bass plug in, it would be Trillion for sure. Yeah, T R I I or T R I L T R I L I A N. It's dope. It's um same people that make Omnisphere. Oh, okay, wow, sonics. yes, yeah. amazing. It's okay, wild. I'll, wow, I'll check, yes, I'll check that out. I also Crazy. use like all the Art- Arturia plugins, like. That's yeah. pretty much if, if if I had to be put, I mean, maybe it's cheating because it's like the whole suite. But if I had to be put on an island I, with at least like one set of plugins, mm-hmm. I could make. I mean, the last track I made was all with that. Yeah. Um. You know, yeah. like the this essentially whatever that emulates the sub fatty, the Moog sub fatty that I, yeah. I think they call it something else in there, but um, the Prophet, like the yeah. Jupiter. I mean, you, pff, done. I mean, it doesn't really have. I would still need the Modart Piano Tech actually piano, but. Mm-hmm. As far as everything else, like I usually do a lot of my bass sounds from there. Yeah, the Mini V3 by Arturia. Yes, that's yes. my that's yeah. my baby. I that's use it, her all yeah. the time. Isn't that emulating the the sub fatty kind of? Is that yeah, am I, I right think now? So. Okay. I think so. Um, it's like if I could have one stage synth though, that in, in addition, that's the one I would want. Actually, I don't know. I don't think it's emulating the sub fatty. I think it's the it's its own in. Uh, oh, okay. Thing. I might be wrong. I don't know. Don't fact check me on that. But, <laughs> but they they have a they have a V collection that it's oh, included. Okay, but I've, cool. I've never met a, a a good keyboardist or piano player that didn't love Arturia in some way after they played with it. I love it, and it took me. I like didn't get it until the beginning of the pandemic. Actually, like I really held off because I was like, oh, there's enough. You know, with any like plugin, if you add enough effects on it, like I have the guitar rig stuff to like beef anything up. Like it's. But at the beginning of the pandemic, I was like, okay, this is, <laughs> yeah. we're really going to be here for a while. And I just, <laughs> I was, I was a little bit nervous not making any money and getting it, but I've just finally treated myself to it. And it's yeah. the best thing I did. You got to treat yourself. I spent, when I mo- first moved to LA, I, when was that? I, this was, um, 2016, maybe when I first like started producing, okay. I, uh, or like joining this band at least. I spent my last thousand dollars in my bank account. I left my job. So my last thousand dollars in my bank account on contact, the complete, ultimate or whatever yeah yeah Yeah. because i was like to be a producer you have to do this and you know i really like i really didn't have to do it i mean i'm glad i have everything but like i really could have i mean uh ableton has so many great native plugins yeah but i just like somebody told me that and i felt like i had to do it and that was Mm -hmm. a scary time (laughs) well no it's it's a real thing though i think it's worth investing in like a good library of sounds because that's that's everything you know yeah totally yeah ableton live 11 updated some nice new packs um like with their uh, strings and some of their what was it the upright piano by spitfire audio oh i haven't checked that out yeah play with spitfire audio stuff uh in live 11 okay amazing Um, also and also, dis- like there, I feel like there, the reverb is really what felt like mm, it. The took hybrid, the next, yeah, the hybrid, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's really nice. I enjoy that, especially because it has like a built-in filter, which is yeah, kind of nice. So you yeah, can EQ so- out at the lows and the highs. Totally. So your ears aren't bleeding. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's awesome. Uh, what other like Ableton stock devices do you like? I love. I mean, I f- I feel like I use like I even have sound toys and everything, but I always use Echo. Uh, mm, the I just I think it's the best one. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I was like, oh yeah, I, I had this whole sound toys, but I always, I always go to that one. Yeah. I always use the Ableton filter. Um, mm. I pretty much put that on. I feel like actually everything. The auto filter. The auto filter. Or, yeah. yeah, yeah. Just you know, at, over the waves or whatever. Yeah. Um, those are mainly the two that I use in Ableton. Yeah, auto filter for the win too. Oh, um, so good. 
and for anybody that hasn't really used it that much, it has um, some really nice uh, filter um, uh, distortion modes. So you can change it to to be like a British emulation. Um, it has like oh, different. I don't yeah, even know if I've done this. Yeah, you can like if you want to saturate it, it has a built-in saturator, which is really nice. Um, if you open up the auto filter, and then uh, at the bottom it says clean. But you can change it from clean to like OSR, which is I think that's like a British amp, maybe or MS2, SMP, and stuff. And then you turn up the drive, and that just gives it some thick saturation. That's Are nice. you kidding me? Amazing. Yeah, somebody showed that to me a couple of years ago. It was like game changer. I was like, hell yeah! Now I just do it every clean. time. Clean. I didn't even know. I see the clean. I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah. I want make it. it make it dirty. Amazing. I'm gonna try that out. Yeah, this is why I do the podcast because yeah, I'm learning. Yeah, this is awesome. Yeah, I'm what what stuff. what plugins do you love on in Ableton? The native ones. If I go into my audio effects folder, I can change the rank. Let me see. It's all pretty much boring stuff at the top, like com glue compressor, saturator, channel EQ. Yes, glue compressor. Uh, Great one. I love using utility to like even make stuff mono or wide in it, like make stuff wider. Use utility um, to make it wider. Yeah, there's a, a stereo width knob, and then. If you turn up the width, you uh, I can turn up like 150 or 170 percent, and then turn on bass mono, and so everything below like 100 hertz is mono, but everything above that I can widen, uh, which is kind of nice. Because we I use utility for like you know turning up the volume of this track, so I don't have mm -hmm. to making mixing easier at the end. But yeah. you can use it to widen. Yeah, you can adjust the stereo field with that too. But the I think that was an update in 10. You know what I love doing is going into uh, going into the clip. And then going into the, oh, let me hold on. Let me just open this. So I can For people it. like me, the scale feature in Live 11 with the clip is nice because you know way more music theory than I do. So. The scale feature, yeah. No, I mean, I still think that's really helpful. Yeah. Um, I can hear birds in the background just like chirping right now. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's very is. zen. It's, uh, I love that. Thank you. Yeah. You know, let me open up a session. Oh, shoot. I don't have my external i can't even open ableton right now never mind but going into um you go into the clip and below like below like transpose or whatever you know yeah. if you go in and make it beats and then you can change the how much of the sound you hear there's a lot of ideas inside the clip so many, <laughs> there's so much you can do inside the so clip. many things you can do <laughs> so many possibilities <laughs> do you ever use the groove pool i do yeah total oh yeah for uh, absolutely I'm so yes. happy to hear that because I get a lot of mixed reviews from people that I would expect to use a groove pool with the kind of music they make. And they're like, I never use it. And yeah, then other I, people love it. I like mean, me. sometimes, I mean, I really, sometimes I have to really work to find the right groove to put on it. Yeah. But I mean, I usually go to, um, let's see. I usually go to the MPC grooves. Yes, me I too. I think are fucking my great. Faves. Yep. Okay. So if you go, if you click on the envelope and then you go to, oh, in the under warping, you go to beats instead of complex. Okay. And then the, under the trans, if you like have oh, both the yeah. arrows pointing to the right, yep. then you change that number. Yep. I love what that does to hi hats or yeah. like a hat pattern specifically. Totally. And I, but the, the thing that I wish like so badly that you could do is I wish you could automate that number. So like mm. have them starting tiny, you know, and then and then just fucking automate that. Automate them so to I, like have longer sustains or shorter sustains. Yes, exactly. So yeah. what I have to do is like I'll do it for like you know certain number for two bars, and then mm -hmm. I'll you know make that a separate little clip, and then I'll like raise the number a little bit and make that a separate clip, and then raise it. So it's like, but it's not a gradual, you know. Well, I think what you might be able to do is you could try messing with like an envelope follower or the shaper, which is um, now a new. It was a Max for Live device, but now it's in Live 11. So if you play with the envelope follower or the shaper, I think you can add some randomization um, with some of the parameters, and you can actually draw it in. So that and might I be could... able to mess with some of the sustain if you play with that a little bit. Yeah, but I do love that trick, like you were saying in the clip, of being able yeah. to mess with the I the love that transients, for hi Yeah, transient the transients, control. yeah, yeah. Big fan, big fan of that. Huge fan of that. Hey, just wanted to take a second to remind you to check out that desktop app, Melodics, that I've been repping for a while. It's a great way to step up your skills producing. For example, I have my Push 2. I can plug that in really quickly, learn how to finger drum, step up my skills doing that, or plug in a MIDI keyboard and practice my scales playing different styles of music. 
So really fun way to gamify the art of practicing and I highly recommend it. There's a free trial, so check that out at melodics.com, M-E-L-O-D-I-C-S.com. Or if you want to join the subscription and have access to way more lessons and content, then use the discount code LPO-20. That's LPO-20. Check it out and back to today's podcast. So as far as like producing, like you you were self-taught for the most part. Um, like I, mean, who, I feel like every producer is, don't you think? To some degree, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah totally. I mean, I've had some great mentors in my life, which I think really helped accelerate my experience yeah, same which i think is really important for people but i think you kind of have to come to a point where you just creatively just figure it out on your own and discover your own sound for yourself totally yes by by many hours alone by yourself in yes. a tiny closet yes making happy <laughs> accidents and failing totally yeah, pretty yeah. much so what are some things that you wish maybe you would have known starting out producing or even years ago that like you know now a loaded question isn't it wish i would have known it doesn't even have to be technical it could be anything uh the first thing that comes to mind is like i kind of thought that there was like a way to do things you know it's like okay like taking piano lessons for instance like this is the scale and this is the right way to play it and this is like the right fingering for each note and like that's just like what it is universally everybody's agreed upon like this is the best way to do this and like you have to like just like sit and practice it and learn it or like, you know, playing this Beethoven piece is like, this is the way to do it. This is the best fingering to do it. This is like, you, you want to get it to sound as close as possible to, you know, to this, whatever. So when I first started producing, I think I thought like, there's a way to do everything. But like the more sessions I got in and the more that I got to collaborate with people and even just like receiving as like se- setting a session back and forth and receiving the session and being like, oh, whoa, they did it this, you know, they did it this way. There are a thousand ways to get to the same result. It feels like in Ableton. And um, I just, I think that freeing myself of like having to do it one way would have been really awesome to do earlier because like Hmm. there's, I mean, still every session I go into, I teach somebody something and they teach me something. And like this, this, you know, Ableton's, I mean, all DAWs like are just like endless tools and people are constantly learning new things in them and changing things and getting new plugins and like learning new things about that and going to max for live and like it's just endless and there's no right way to do it yeah yeah i wish that i had freed myself earlier maybe but like the background i came from like i just thought like oh, i need to learn more i need to do more and like you're always going to learn more and you're always going to do more but yeah however you're doing it is probably okay yeah, definitely. I mean, I can relate to that too. Cause I played in a jazz band growing up in high school playing drums. And then cool. I went to the whole electronic music thing. I had to unlearn a lot of the things I was taught technically just to kind of free myself up to make whatever I was feeling in the moment. It's a real thing. It's a real thing. That's good. That's good advice. That's, that's real. Like, cause I think I've talked about like the mental side of producing on this podcast quite a bit. And I feel like that's something that people don't even think about as often as they should. The mental side producing is so, I mean, also what was like a really hard adjustment for me is um, I'm like such a social creature and to really get good at this, like it was just a lot of hours alone by myself, you know, like the hardest part for me at the beginning was just like being comfortable, like opening up the, opening up the program every day and like remembering like, oh yeah, how do I like get into like the MIDI clip and like, how do I draw in a clip and like, I mean, just like this, the most basic stuff when I very, very, very first started was like every it just took so much brain power for me and getting comfortable just like opening up the program and navigating it just yeah. like the simple buttons um and like like navigating each side of the of the program you know arrangement and clip view and like understanding that and it was like kind of a lonely <laughs> it was kind of lonely at first <laughs> yeah. um and i i think that like so also as i've like gotten more comfortable and um you know i like i put in that work to you know to a point and what I really enjoy though is like, okay, I know I'm never gonna be the best bass player. So like I'll get a track to like the 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 best place I can and like I'll take it into like Cheever for Michael Cheever's this amazing live bass player. And I'm like, here's like the chords and here's the basic concept, and then I'll get to like collaborate with him, you know? And yeah. like doing that in Ableton still, or like uh, I know this amazing percussion player, and like I'll kind of like structure a track to where I know I want it to be, and then like get to bring him in, and like here are my ideas. Like I'm sure you have way better ideas because you're a professional percussion player. <laughs> like where to? So yeah. that's been fun to like finally get to start collaborating again with people. Yeah. Because I don't know. I think it is. It's that's like always the weirdest. I've always am so jealous of vocalists, singers, songwriters, because I feel like part of their job 
is to go out into the world and live their life because then they have material to write. Like their job is to like go experience the world and like look at it and, and interact with it and like write about it. And like a producer, really to be the, be the best producer, like sit in a dark room and just like work. And it's like, it's lonely. <laughs> <laughs> no, it can be. I think sunlight is like underrated in a lot of studios. Yes. <laughs> you gotta have that, that vitamin D. Get, totally. Just... That's why my door is open right now. I mean, you can hear the birds. Like I have to have that. Yeah. 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 You should sample them. I Oh, I have. Yeah. They actually, they were in the last, I did a Janis Joplin remix. Yeah. I heard that. It was great. They're in that track. Yeah. Hey, that's awesome. <laughs> I think I saw that in one of your uh, live videos, uh, replays from the Brooklyn Mirage, I think. Oh, really? I think, yeah. yeah. I saw that. Yes. One of the Instagram posts. Oh, yeah. I love that track. That's, that's, that's one of my favorite tracks. That's Never going to be on my top five, but I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I got, so this is like a, a, a label uh, in Italy has has this vocal and they I normally would never I probably would never have done a remix for this label probably but then when they're like we have a Janis Joplin track I'm like I will do whatever it takes like, like here it is here you I go. will take whatever fee I have to have this <laughs> <laughs> that's cool that's really cool yeah it sounded great um so like when you're collaborating with somebody like that like uh, you know the space player whoever you talked about do you typically like to have a song structured before you take it to them and have like most of it produced? Like, or do you ever just start from scratch in the room? Yeah. I mean, I would like to get better at starting from scratch in the room, but like, I'm kind of like a type A control freak. So yeah, I usually like have an idea for a, a track and I want to like get it as far as I can. Um, just because I sometimes find like those sessions, like, you know, structured sessions can like be a little bit more, uh, productive, if you will, you know, like I know that like this is like the vibe I'm going for for this part. Um, here's the overall. Vibe. Yeah, I kind of like like to like get it, mm -hmm. the idea to where I can get it, and then I um yeah, and then I'll bring it in. But I'm working on this like and like honestly seeing like Mark's Mark Rip what how do you pronounce his last name again? Mark Ribier. Yeah. Ribier. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Seeing him like I was like yeah I really want to get better at this like going into a session with absolutely nothing. And just like letting the flow happen and like seeing where it takes me. Yeah. I really want to work on that. I'm like really bad at that in my life in general. I mean, even like every single night before I go to bed, like I make a very detailed, exactly, you know, to-do list of like every minute in every hour is like completely occupied. And I just know exactly. So I'm really working on like, you know, when you think of like artists, it's probably not what you think of. Um, so yeah. I, I would like to get better at that. But right now I'm not that great. No, but I feel you. I'm the same way with my band. Like I like to have kind of an organized chaos session where I just like bring it to them and I'll bring them in and be like, all right, here's your eight to 16 bars go. And then I'll yeah. just let them do their thing. I'll go drink coffee, come back five minutes later, hit stop and then edit whatever. Totally. I'm also like the editing part is like, I've worked with some, like some people that are like, ah, and like just like throwing things away. Like, just like kind of like, Oh, I found something I like. I'm not gonna listen to anything else. This is great. And I'm like, editing takes me forever. Cause I'm like, I have to listen to every single thing that we recorded with a fine tooth comb and like a color coordinate, you know, green is like, I really mm -hmm. like it. And then orange is like, maybe I it's a crazy process for me. Like I, like yeah. I work a lot with Tucker, Sophie Tucker, and yeah. he's just like, great. I like this, everything else, whatever, you know, it's just like so <laughs> free flowing. I'm like, God, that would be amazing to get to that point. Yeah, I mean, I think it's like anything. The more you do it, the more it starts to become second nature. You know, like Mark Ribier, for example. I mean, you mentioned his like ability just to kind of free flow and jump into the moment and make stuff up on the spot. And he's awesome at it because that's all he does every day, right? He's Yeah, he uses like, I think the Boss RC505. And I think he's just really good at using that because he's used it for so many years. Yeah. And so he could probably play that like with his toes blindfolded if he wanted to, you know? And I, I think the same is really true. Just like using Ableton or it's a, so a MIDI true. controller, just a MIDI it controller. Is so true. I just started using the DJS 1000. So was, yeah, in my set. So like instead of the fourth CDJ, I replaced it with this like sampler. And like, I just started doing it in the pandemic so I can like live loop, essentially like live record my keyboard and like make sequences and stuff. Wait, what so was that, that I, again? What did you use the, to loop? It's the, it's the DJS 1000. It looks like a CDJ, oh, okay. but it's, um, it's a sampler, essentially a sequencer. Um, and so you can like record audio into it and then sequence it and like slice it and do all sorts of crazy shit. Or you can oh, also have samples yeah, yeah. loaded into it. I've seen this. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I started doing that when I DJ, but like, it's funny because I... I'm really like just now to the point where I can step behind, uh, you know, four CDJs and be like, this is my rocket ship and I can take it anywhere. And like, it's taken <laughs> me years to get here. Right. So I'm like, I'm, I'm find myself being, I need to be a little bit more patient with myself with the DJS. I'm like, 
I want to, I just like want it to be like seeing Mark and that, and I want it to be like that, you know, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah. it, that's just going to take time. It just takes time, yeah. you know? I think the whole concept of practice makes perfect is kind of bullshit because there's no such thing as perfect, but you can get pretty close. Yeah, yeah, t- yeah, totally. And I even like, see, this is part of my schedule that I'm just, I'm trying to like block off like the first two hours of my day to just be practicing, like practicing piano, which I still do. Mm. I still take piano lessons, uh, practicing cool. piano and like doing DJS, like practicing DJS tricks essentially, you know, and like, I just need to get it's so hard to like keep that blocked off of my schedule. Like all of a sudden phone calls will creep in or like meetings mm-hmm. or, you know. Yeah. Would well, do you have a pretty strong team that like can help you with some of these things? I imagine I that you do. I have an amazing team. I have a full, I have so many goddamn people on my team at this point. And it's still That's awesome. I have a full, I just hired a full-time assistant who like literally sits next to me and is like working her butt off all day. I have um, an amazing manager and then two people on the management team. And like, it's, <laughs> still like you know at the end of the day like a lot of this is actually you know i just have even more emails from them of things i have to approve <laughs> so <laughs> but yes i, I am I for sure couldn't do anything without them at this point but i still need to i just need to get better at like boundaries and you know being like nobody can schedule anything in these two hours but like yeah. i'm always like well it's just one day of not practicing it's fine and then yeah. all of a sudden there's five days have gone by <laughs> I have a really successful business friend of mine, He's like multi, multi millionaire, and does consulting for like Fortune 500. And one thing he told me it's always stuck with me is like, you know, you're becoming more successful when you can start saying no easier. And I was like, that's really true. That is that's so true. Cause I still have a scarcity. Like, if I say no, I mean, like, even like I'm working, like, my agents are, I have like five agents too, or maybe like actually I just signed with Europe too. So like way more than that. I like <laughs> I literally have like eight agents. Oh, wow. And they um I was recently on a call with all of them. They're like, you're gonna have to say no to things right now in order like we have to say no to shows that like, you know, like lower money shows, whatever, because your fee is like it really should be you have to start raising your fee this way. You have yeah. to start you have to start saying no to like make bigger gains. Yeah. But that is so hard for me. I'm like every oh, time, and like they legally have to present me with all the all the show offers that we're getting, you know. And I'm like, say yes to everything. And they're like, no, we cannot say yes to everything. <laughs> it's really hard for me. Well, I mean, that's exciting though. At the same time, because that just means there's more opportunities coming. Yeah. So yeah, it's a it's a bittersweet thing, I guess. I know totally. I'm like, it's a great problem to have, but I'm I'm struggling with the scarcity of it. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. So what made you move to Austin eventually? Because you said you were in LA. Yeah, school yeah. Berkeley, and yep. then you moved to Austin. Did you have family there? Or? No, man. I so my partner and I met in Austin. We've been together for nine years now. Congrats! And he, thank you. Um, it's a goddamn feat. <laughs> he um sold. He started Snowglow Music Festival, and cool. um in South Lake Tahoe, and has a venue in San Francisco, and did Snowball in Colorado. Anyways, he sold his company to MTV Viacom, and then um. Like right before the pandemic, thank God. Like, wow, I can't believe the luck of that. Yeah, for real. To be in the live events last year. Wow. Whew. So um sold it to MTV Viacom. And then um we love Austin and we met here and we bought property down here and um are building our house. So cool. We just thought it was a I, LA was like not for for me. It wasn't for my soul. And I didn't really realize that even as much until I moved here and like we do this like walk around the lake every morning next to our house and like nobody gives a fuck what you do for a living and people are just like it's just awesome energy here i'm i'm loving Austin's it Austin's cool yeah. yeah it's got like a good family vibe and totally Austin. totally i've been there twice and both times like the uber drivers were the nicest people i've ever met in my life <laughs> yeah totally it was like, you don't normally get that like <laughs> totally yeah yeah. It's so true. It's it's also hot as when I was there, I was sweating every five seconds. I'd walk outside, it was just poof, just drenched it's, in sweat. It's lit- it's 88 degrees here, and this is a very cool day. It's insane. Yeah, yeah. it's so hot. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but I mean, that's the price you pay for living in a really dope community. Yeah. Yeah. It's great culture. What's the uh piano house scene or I guess electronic scene like in Austin? Really? Yeah, great question. You know, I didn't because it's it's very much focused on live music, obviously, you know, oh, yeah. like um my cousin actually lives here and he plays the bass for Willie Nelson, which is pretty cool. That's but cool. um it's like and K- KUTX, the NPR affiliate radio station here is an amazing radio station. I feel like is like really at the epicenter of the live music scene. Um and there's like, you know, free blues in the park and 
just like constantly like live bands playing everywhere all the time. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of like, where is the electronic scene? But there is one. Um, there's a few. There's this place called The Venue that my friend um, uh, Peter Gross books with Coalition. That's that's pretty cool. Um, and they did – God, there was just an electronic festival here. Um, Andrew Parsons books that. And he's opening like, up a venue. Um, and like King's Hall, which like uh, historically had some like – house legends they're reopening that so i think that the electronic music scene is building but it's definitely not the focus which i actually really like i mean i come from my background is like my parents were deadheads i kind of like think of myself when i dj as like a one-woman jam band you know like i take like drum loops and like mix it with like bass loops and different piano loops and like so i actually like really i'd rather go to a live music show sometimes (laughs) um that's awesome so it's like yeah it's it's a great scene for me but i i think that it's like the electronic scene seems to be building here Good. Yeah. When I, w- I was there uh, a couple of years ago for the DIY musicians conference. Oh, cool. I don't know if you've heard of that? No. Um, yeah, it's all, it's all right. Uh, it's run by CD baby. So oh, that's, cool. that's like their annual conference or whatever that they have there in Austin. Uh, it, oh, was, rad. it was dope. It was really dope. They Super did a great cool. job. Um, but yeah, I mean that there's a definitely a strong like folk scene there. For sure. And like, and yeah. also C3 is based out of Austin. So C3, they yeah. just, Live Nation just bought them, but like they do. Lollapalooza and Bonnaroo and ACL Live and and Austin City Limits and um they also do stubs and like and they do have a booker like the booker there that books all their electronic stages at all the festivals. Um I was recently talking to him like where is like let's build that scene here? You know, yeah. like where what venue do you like do you guys even have a and they, they're they're kind of like trying to find the right electronic venue to to program here. Yeah. No, I feel like indie is the same way. I feel like Austin and indie are similar in that sense. Like the, really? the electronic music is growing, but it's still kind of like in infancy. And yeah. the jam bands are like the hot thing. I like mean, fucking everywhere. everywhere. It's, it's a hoot. It's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I like it all personally. Yeah. Same. Awesome. So let's talk a little bit about some of these other nonprofits or like groups that you're working with. You're working yeah. with uh, like FEMA House. Uh, so Fem House is Fem House, is, sorry. Yeah, Fem House yeah. is my nonprofit. Yeah. yeah. So that is my 501c3 that teaches someone how to produce using Ableton. Um, we do free monthly workshops. Um, Minnie Bear, Lauren Kopp is our is our educator, and she's amazing. She taught herself Ableton by reading the manual front to back. She is a oh, beast. That's cool. Um, and I, but I, I guess the manual is really really awesome. I I really want to read yeah, it. Yeah, it day. is. No, I heard it's, it's like super well written, and I'm gonna write that down. See, this is like there's so many things I want to do, right? <laughs> Um, yeah, and, those five agents are hopefully helping. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or eight, well, however many there was. So fucking many, too many. Um, and uh, then we have online courses that are sliding scale, free for women of color, that are like more in depth work, like take the workshop topics and dive deeper. And those are four week programs. Um, and then we do uh, we do a scholarship program for women of color. Uh, we have two participants right now who are fucking amazing. Um, we just launched, uh, she is the producer in partnership with, she is the music, which is Alicia Keys's nonprofit yeah, and Emily Lazar's, uh, we are moving the needle, which was crazy. 3000 people signed up in a day from all over the world, Brazil, that's huge, Mexico, Canada. It was insane. Congrats. Um, thank you. Yeah. And Ableton gave a, this is insane to me. They gave, um, a license, an Ableton license to every single person who signed up. Wow. And we thought it was only going to be like a few hundred. Then it was like 3,000 a day because Alicia Keys talked about it and that like blew it up. And they 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 stood behind their word. They gave it to every single person. Isn't that fucking crazy? Shout out to Ableton. Honestly, shout out to Ableton. They have That's been huge. so supportive. They care so much about like, you know, getting this in, in the hands of more women. They're, they have been so amazing. I'm a, That's cool. I'm just like so grateful for them. Yeah, um, yeah. And then we have, you know, Moog and, and Native Instruments and Guitar Center are all, are all sponsors of ours and have helped give gear to um, and different, you know, gear and marketing um, throughout many of our initiatives. Um, we That's do, uh, I have a radio show on Diplo's Revolution on Sirius yeah, XM called I was listening House. to that. Great. Cool. Yeah. And I interview yeah. different female producers. And uh, is that every week? Do you release an episode every, every week? week? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you just like close your eyes and like breathe really deep You're like <sighs> like actually today i'm like i have the so the first episode of every month is is like just my episode mm-hmm. the other ones like i interview other people and they make the mixes and stuff and I, all i have to do is like put it together which you know is takes time but it's not as like the the first the first one every month it takes me though because i'm just so 
type A. Yeah. And I just like really like to. And also it's like kind of my way when I make mixes, it actually helps improve my DJing. It's like different ways to think about. Mm-hmm. I'll make edits of an acapella or whatever that I can like put it in the right key and then bounce it. And I can like use that live and stuff. Yeah. So it just takes me forever. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, as long as you're still enjoying it. Maybe, yes. Yeah. I know, you know, I think I'm I'm working on my approach to be like, this is fun. Like this is, yeah. I get to make, this is, remember, this is supposed to be fun, but I just put so much pressure on myself that, mm. but for the most part, it's, it, for the most part, it's fun. <laughs> yeah. No, I have to constantly remind myself like why I'm doing what I'm doing. Like it's a real thing because I you just overwork yourself. And then like, I'm like, I need Prozac or weed or something. Yeah, I'm, you're so st- I'm so stressed. <laughs> but then, yeah. And then eventually I'm just like, and then, and then you play a really dope show and you're yeah. then like, you're like, oh, that's so like, worth, it's all it. worth it. It's so all worth it. it. Totally. And then you have an existential crisis a week after that all over uh, again. This is literally where I'm at. <laughs> I just played Lollapalooza. I had the most amazing experience. I'm actually having, a, this is your, this is the day you're catching me a thousand percent. Like my, yeah. my boyfriend was like, you literally just play. What is wrong with you? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I'm stressed out. I'm, I'm oh, you know, and it's like, God, ugh, why you're uh, playing music? Like you're not the president of the United States. You're not like, bra- you're you're not a brain surgeon. You literally don't have to like, nobody will die if you don't, you know, why, <laughs> why do I feel like it's so stressful? It's so funny. No, it's a real thing. I'm sure I'm not a doctor, but I'm sure there's some kind of like chemical explanation in our brains when you have this like massive dopamine boost, when you're playing in front of thousands of people and it's just like this huge surge of dopamine or whatever, and your brain is just like firing. You're happy. Everything's great. You don't sleep for two days. And then you wake up and like, you're by yourself. You're in your studio. Dude, and you're just I, like, what do I do now? Like, you I just, have been thinking about this so much. It's a like, thing. Whenever it's like, oh, like, I can't believe, like, I see your career taking off. It's so cool. And it's like, the more that happens, <laughs> I am living in these extremes. So I'm living in these extreme highs and extreme lows because, yep. like, you can't you can't go that high without coming down. You know, yep. it's just like is how like our brains like they run out of dopamine and like and so it's just this like like for instance the other day I walked up to get a coffee and uh, yesterday and like I I was listening to like. KUT, KUTX was playing at the coffee house and she was just like the the host was like talking about like going to a show in the park that weekend and then you know coming home and like like it's just like I realized her life is like this you know and my yeah. life is just like this <laughs> it's a roller coaster and just like it's flying just like, off the tracks how do it's like it's not I know it's not sustainable so I need to figure out a way to like do this more yeah for me when I start to feel that like when I'm just like feeling that low I have to force myself to like meditate or work out. Those are like my two options. I either like do some yoga, light some candles, or I'm like going for a run. Yeah. Running is what I, yeah, I run every morning for that. I have to, it's different. I think for everybody, but totally. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. For sure. Mental health awareness, everybody. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. Well, okay. Last but not least, I'd love to talk about animal talk. Is that, how's, how's that going? Oh, it's great. Um, I mean, animal. we released Meat Again, which was the record that changed my life. So um, yeah. shout out Animal Talk. So Animal Talk is a um, record label and a publishing company that uh, I started, me and my partner and Sophie, T- Sophie and Tucker of Sophie Tucker. Um, and we have released a handful of, of my records and then remixes. Um, but mainly our focus is the publishing company. So we have a third... Uh, a joint venture with third side music and they are a publisher. And so we sort of act as a and R um, signing artists to the, to the, to the, to their publishing deal. And they like work the catalog. So we cool. just signed. Um, oh my God. What is his artist name? <laughs> <laughs> we signed an amazing uh, percussionist. Who's like also starting his own artist project. Gahate. And it okay. is awesome. He out. hasn't released any music yet, but he like already got a massive sync. He's it's it's really it's like more almost in like the res world. But the um Roland is Roland Garcia is is his name, is his real name. Um and like he's a like third generation percussion player. Like his dad toured with um Stevie Wonder and like he's worked with truly I mean, he he was the um uh, the person leading Sunday service, the doing all the percussion oh, wow. and music programming and yeah he's that's cool. Kanye's sunday service he's and he's worked with, like you know he was just in the studio with earth wind and fire the other day like he's a legend but yeah. his artist project is really it's like uh it's like in the world of like res you know, like hmm. this like big like bassier dark it's really cool it's it's wild yeah and, and he has like that. that he has a um, made an electronic drum kit that he plays tight 
Yeah, yeah. I love chat, that. So watch out for that. Yeah. We will. Yeah, I'll have to listen to his stuff later. Cool. That's really dope. Um, is there a specific genre that you are signing with? You Animal know, Talk? I mean, like we're we're house artists, like dance, dance. I guess not even dance artists, you know. And so, no, there really isn't a specific because Roland is or Gahate is like completely outside of anything that we would play. Like Sophie or Sophie and yeah. Tucker or me would play in our sets, and like I'm definitely a product of them. Um, but we just got really excited about him. And like, I, I think that for us, it's like any artist that, um, works hard and is an awesome person and we believe in their music and we work closely with third side to, to talk about, you know, the longevity of a, of a career, et cetera. Hmm. Well, that's really cool. I love that you are like supporting other artists in that way Yo, and just gotta. being able to like get people going. Yeah. On totally. top of all the work you're doing for yourself, it's a lot. <laughs> Well, I am the product of Sophie and Tucker's support. So like having an artist champion you is is everything. And like mm -hmm. the, you know, we always say the greatest currency is belief. Like saying, I believe in you, you can do this is is like, I wouldn't have done it otherwise, you know? So uh, um, we always, yeah, that's just always something that we try to use with our platforms. That's so cool. I love that. I can tell you put a lot of work and energy and effort into your music and you're a great person. It seems like, and I appreciate you being on the podcast and thanks thank for you. having me. This is yeah. a blast. I appreciate your time. Yeah, for sure. It's been really fun. Maybe you can just tell everybody listening as we wrap up the best place to stay in touch with you. Yeah. Um, I am pretty active on my Instagram at L P G O B G I. So L P G I O B B I. A bird, yes. Yeah, is that a bird and or a cicada? I think I know it's one or the other. It sounded um, terrifying. It's it's huge. Totally. And then um, this is femhouse.com and at this is femhouse on all the handles. And all my handles are LPGOB as well. Cool. Yeah, I'll include the all those links in the show notes, everybody listening as usual. So go down there, click support LP. And go check out our music. It's dope. It's real bouncy. It's good driving music, honestly. Oh, cool. I like, like that. I was, yes. Yeah. I feel like the Hayden James remix I did is like, I was made for a driving track. So yes, yeah. I agree yeah. with that. I love it. Cool. <laughs> well, thanks again. Let's definitely stay in touch. Awesome. Um, I love that. Yeah. And send me your music. I'd love to hear it. Oh, I totally will. I th actually, cool. I, th I think I did. Did I th you? I, th I think I sent you that MCS track a while ago and you responded and you're like, oh, yeah, really? it sounds really dope. Okay, I'm well, pretty sure you did. If not, I'll send it to you again. Send it again. Send it again. Cool. Awesome. All right. Thank well, you. thanks again. It. Yeah. Have, have a great, great week, LP. I'll see you later. Hey, thanks everybody for listening to the podcast. It would mean a lot to me if you hit that like or subscribe button wherever you're listening. Also, I'd be happy to hook you up with the latest version of Ableton Live or a discount. So check it out. Go to liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton liveproducersonline.com slash buy Ableton. Happy to hook you up. If you want to join my membership, there's a free trial and you can access all of my Ableton Live courses. You can access all the downloads I've made, including sampling my Moog Sub 37 analog synth. You can access different webinars that I've done teaching about how I produce my music as Philia. Would love to stay connected with you on the socials. You can follow me personally and my music at Philia Music. That's P-H-I-L-I-A Music. Also, you can follow at Live Producers Online as well for my Ableton training. If you want to be the first to receive new episodes when they come out, go to liveproducersonline.com slash newsletter, and I'll send you some other great content to help you step up your skills producing in Ableton Live, which is the greatest doll in the world, as we know. Big thanks, everyone, for listening. Stay tuned every Tuesday for new episodes, and I will see you very soon. Bye-bye.